get through. Thank you everybody for joining us for the sixth installment of the COVID-19 think tanks. Um, we're very excited to be putting this on and just basically having a meeting of the minds of COVID-19. Um, if you haven't, if you are not familiar with the Society for Health Systems, a little brief overview before we kick this off. Uh, their mission is to improve lives through better healthcare delivery. And we accomplish that in a multitude of ways, one of them being this think tank. Um, but we wanna cultivate a community of healthcare improvement professionals that is passionate about really making a difference, fostering innovative problem solving through systems thinking, and really developing healthcare leaders, professionals, clinicians, and students. So speaking to the clinicians, healthcare professionals, students, everybody, um, we have a five communities of practice, six, sorry, six communities of practices um, that SHS can break down into. So we have education, academic, clinical, student, young professionals, and experienced professionals. So I didn't introduce myself, but my name is Allie Hobbs and I am the chair for the Young Professionals Group. Um, and Aaron Kane has been helping us as well, so you'll hear him um, throughout this presentation. But if you're interested in joining or getting more involved and think uh, community of practice might be right for you, please reach out to one of us or join using the link at the bottom. Uh, like I said, or I haven't said it yet, but we will be recording this and sending out these present the slides after this meeting. So um, look for everything there. Like I said, this is the sixth installment. So we have all the previous think tanks recorded and we'll be sending out after this. So if you hear us talking about something we've talked about previously, feel free to jump in and listen to it. With that, I'm going to go ahead and announce the agenda and then pass it off to our speakers. Today, we have Stephen presenting on N95 mask decontamination. And then right after that, we have Dr. Patrick Fullerton talking about reactivating departments that have been impacted from COVID-19 uh, using a phased approach. So very excited today. As always, feel free to jump in, ask questions. We really want this to be a discussion and we look forward to everybody collaborating. All right, Stephen, you ready? I'm ready. Give me one second. Gotta find you in the list. Unless you, you, I think you can click the button and just take presentation, otherwise. Yep, does that work? Yes, you just need to Share your screen and we're good to go. It's the third um, option from the left in the list in the bullet, the um, little bubbles that are at the bottom. It's with the arrow pointing up. Oh, am I pulling up the presentation on my end? Uh, we can do it that way or we can have Allie do it. She's got it either way. I don't have it up at the moment, Allie. That's fine. Can you guys see it? Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you all. Um, my name is Stephen Tysick, and I'm an internal consultant with uh, the Main Health System. Uh, Main Health is comprised of um, 14 different medical centers up here in the state of Maine, and a number of other uh, ancillary groups that that partner with us as well. Um, so. Back uh, now, probably about two months, um, as we all were, we, we were faced with the upcoming challenge of uh, a somewhat limited supply of N95s, uh, a challenge externally with sourcing new N95s, and a, a, a need to develop some kind of a backup plan for um, in the event that we, we advance forward through this pandemic and are not able to source new N95s, is there a way in which we could extend the life um, of the N95s that we have? And so um, a team that uh, included myself, um, our innovation center, uh, and some other 
uh, staff from across the health system came together to to really try and figure out what was the, the best process that we could use uh, internally. And so many of you might be familiar with the different options that are out there. Um, a company named Battelle was the first company to get uh, expedited FDA approval. Um, their system uses vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Um, there was another system that uses gas, another system that, that uses heat that I believe your think tank has, has heard a previous presentation about. Um, and then there's UVC light, which ended up being the decision we made as a health system. Um, the CDC and um, a, a similar group, the uh, N95 uh, Decontamination Consortium has done a lot of work in trying to rapidly figure out which of those four processes is the best. And um, no matter which one you choose, there's pluses and minuses. Um, we've spent extensive time trying to parse that out on our end. Um, but at the end of the day, our safety team, our epidemiologists, and our uh, infection control decided UVC was the way to go. So uh, what I put together was a presentation that we've shared across the health system for all of our, uh, for all of our hospitals uh, about what this process actually looks like. So we can go to the next slide. So one of the first things that we, as an innovation team, tried to do was to leverage some type of barcoding um, on the N95s themselves. So um, for, for anyone who isn't aware, um, when we entered into this pandemic, just our health system alone had 14 different N95 types that had been fitted to staff across the, uh, the system. There's a tremendous amount of different types of N95s and obviously with the uniquenesses of a face, um, you need to have those different models so that folks can wear them. Um, but one of the things that uh, is very important is even if myself and, and Aaron, for example, are both fitted to uh, an 8110S N95, the minute that we pinch that nose cone is the minute that that mask can no longer be worn by somebody else with the same level of uh, security and coverage as uh, the previous wearer. So for those reasons, we had to figure out a way that we could uniquely tag the mask back to the individual. And the other thing that we had to determine was a way to track how many times the mask had gone through a decontamination cycle. Um, there's literature out there uh, that says, you know, up to 10 times potentially is acceptable for an N95 to go through the decontamination cycle. Um, the first hospital to go live with this was Nebraska Med. Um, they are doing a decontamination up to 10 times so long as the mask uh, is still intact and there's no breakdown of the straps or anything like that. Um, but we are going, and I'll explain this in a little bit, above and beyond the level of intensity of the UVC light that they were using. And so for our purposes, we decided that we were only gonna have the mask go through three cycles. So for that reason, um, we tried to leverage barcoding technology and where that landed us was in the pharmacy with a barcode scanning system that they use for narcotics. The, the reason why we couldn't in the end go with that is because even though the barcoding system could identify a unique uh, barcode tag to a user, the system couldn't count. And so we would have had to have a separate counting mechanism uh, with this process. And so what we ended up with was a much simpler process where we are using what's called thermal butterfly labels. Um, the mask that every single one of our staff members gets fitted to ends up having two butterfly thermal labels folded over the elastic band. One of those stays blank, and every time the mask goes through a successful decontamination cycle, it gets a hole punch like you can see in the picture. And then the other butterfly label gets an Avery shipping label printed out with the unique user's first initial last name, their employee number, the hospital and the unit that they work in. And so now every single one of our N95s that's been handed out to staff is uniquely tagged in that way back to the end user. We can go to the next slide. 
So once somebody goes through our fit testing, they not only leave with that individually fitted N95 that's tagged, they also come away with a clean paper bag that has their unique information on it. And that paper bag is what they use to store their mask during their shift. So a lot of our folks that are using these masks are, are running around the clinical units um, and being able to keep that mask in a brown paper bag is very important, both for uh, infection prevention reasons and to keep the mask uh, intact. And then also staff leave with a sheet of those Avery labels that are printed out when they get fit tested. So now folks aren't having to print out those labels every time they need a new mask. Their leadership will keep a folder of all of those labels for their staff so that now they have those readily available when they need a new mask moving forward. Let's go to the next slide. So how this plays out on the unit is if I'm working a clinical shift that requires me to use my N95, when I'm done with my shift, I take the mask off, I put it back in the brown paper bag, and each of the units uh, that are live with using N95s because of either COVID positive patients or PUIs that they're caring for has a soiled utility room. And the soiled utility room is the home base for where the staff are going to place those paper bags at the end of their shift that have those used N95s in them. And so if I'm working the shift, I put my mask in the paper bag and bring the paper bag to the soiled utility room. I put that into the plastic tote that is uniquely labeled to that room and that department. And then after I give up that mask, now I am in the position where I have to go and get a new mask. So what we have determined on site here at Maine Health is that each mask will be worn for one clinical usage day, then it will be handed in. And then for the next clinical usage day, that staff member is going to need to get a brand new mask that is again tagged uniquely to them. Next slide. And so once those masks are handed in, those totes can fit approximately 29 masks before they're full. So each day on site at Maine Medical Center, which is our flagship hospital within Maine Health, the different units that have those soiled utility rooms with totes get those totes collected by our environmental services staff. So they would come up, they would seal the tote, they put a biohazard sticker over the seam of that tote, and then they take that away. Now, each of our sites have been outfitted with at least four or five totes within their area. So they constantly will be able to have a replenishment of those totes as we take them away. Um, to decontaminate those masks that are housed within them. Next slide. So as those EVS staff members from environmental services go out throughout the hospital, they're collecting those totes, and then they're going to bring those totes down to our loading dock. Next slide. And so what we have right now is a UVC chamber that has been built next to our linen facility um, that is off site from our main campus here in, uh, in Portland, Maine. And so what's nice about this is for all of our different sites that are utilizing the N95s, we didn't have to create any additional supply routes. Those get put on those dirty linen trucks every day and brought out to our location where we have that UVC chamber. And you can see it there in the, uh, in that middle picture, we have what's called uh, metal U-boats that we use to transport large amounts of supplies and equipment within our organization. Those were the designated uh, uh, pieces of equipment that we chose to move these totes throughout the, the organization. And so one thing that is also is not pictured, um, once the mask goes into the brown paper bag and into the tote, we decided that we were going to line those totes with a, uh, a poly liner. We chose uh, a pretty robust type of plastic garbage bag that we have available within our health system. Um, and that was just recommended to us by our infection prevention colleagues as just one extra way in which we can assure that these, uh, that these contaminated masks are absolutely meeting the highest level of infection prevention standards that we could have for the system. 
then like I mentioned, those U-boats are carried by our linen trucks uh, out to our offsite location where the UVC chamber is located. Next slide. And so once those uh, U-boats arrive at our offsite location, we have our staff on site that pull those uh, U-boats off the truck. They bring those using the uh, the proper PPE up into our staging area. And our staging area is a place where we have four full-time staff that are going to be donned in full head-to-toe PPE um, in accordance with all the, the regulatory needs that anybody else would have while handling these items. Um, and they will be stationed in our staging area. And their role will be to get these totes opened, make sure that um, all of the masks that have arrived to that location are still in uh, good standing. They don't need to be tossed because any of the elastic is broke or anything like that. And so once those masks go through that level of quality control, they then get hung up on racks that we have that are going to go into, um, into the chamber. Next slide. And so it's a little bit hard to see in that picture right in the middle of the screen, but um, what we tried to do was to use S hooks uh, and to pull the straps as much as we could, uh, both from, from the top and from the bottom. And the reason why that's necessary for our purposes is because we're using UVC light, um, a key component is ensuring that these N95s don't have any shadows when they're in the chamber. Um, it, having any shadows while the mask would be in the chamber would uh, effectively limit the amount of decontamination that would occur. And so we decided to use these S hooks to pull the elastic um, within reason, not to a point where they would break, but just enough so that the inside and all the little nooks and crannies of those masks can be pulled up and, and opened. Um, and so then you can see uh, in that lower left picture, uh, one of the staff members then would push that rack into the chamber itself. It's a little hard to see from the picture uh, where you can see the UVC light actually on in the lower right, but there's a track that runs along the bottom of the floor to ensure that these racks go in, they're stationary and they won't be moving. Uh, very similar to you know, when you drive into a car wash and you gotta get your tire onto that, onto that track to be able to pull through. Um, and so these masks would go into the UVC chamber. We also have a picture there of all the safety controls that were built on the outside of the chamber. Um, but once they're in there, uh, you can sort of see it from this picture. The entire walls of the chamber are all built with reflective material. And the idea being that we not only want the UV light uh, shining uh, straight towards the mask, but because of all those different little angles and, and nooks and crannies. We want to be reflecting that light in all directions. And so one of the things that we just went through over the last two weeks was using a, a physicist from a local university here in Maine who spent quite a bit of time uh, using different voltage meters all throughout this chamber at different heights, at different distances, at different angles, um, to be able to determine essentially within this entire chamber what spot where a mask could sit receives the least amount of UVC intensity. And based on that least amount of UVC intensity, what then is the maximum amount of time that's needed in order to get that particular spot the proper amount of exposure to decontaminate the mask? And so he just finished that work. And based on that work, um, now he's calculating what that cycle time needs to be. Uh, so that we ensure that all the masks are in there for the appropriate amount of time to get decontaminated, no matter what height uh, or space on that rack they might happen to be at. Next slide. And so after those masks go through that process, um, on the other end of the chamber is another door that those masks would be pulled out of. Um, the staff who pull those masks out then we'll, um, we'll put a hole punch through that one blank butterfly label that's used to track the number of times that the mask has gone through uh, the decontamination process. 
And then the mask is put into a clean paper bag. The clean paper bag is then put into a clear plastic bag. And then those items then are put into a banker's box. And the reason why, and you'll see that on the next slide, is because as an organization, we made the decision that we're gonna go live with decontaminating these masks, but that at present, we have enough of a supply that we can put these into storage to be able to buy us some time to see whether or not we even need to get to a point where we need to start redistributing these back to the staff. And so our hope is that, um, you know, at least to date, our, our experience with the pandemic here in Maine has been, uh, thank goodness, a lot less in terms of the total number of positive cases, uh, both in-house and the total number of cases then requiring um, advanced care with ventilators that at present we don't feel we need to um, be redistributing these masks and that we have enough supply to carry us for a number of months moving forward but on the next slide you'll be able to see how we're storing these in the event that we do need to get these back to the end users in real time and so what you can see here is sort of our process for how we're storing these so when the masks come out of the chamber on the other end, decontaminated, there's a staging area and then there's a huge storage area. And so we're going to store these in columns by the type of, um, by the type of mask that the end user has and in rows by the actual unit that the mask is going back to. And so what this allows us to do is if, for example, we determine that the N95 small masks are no longer going to be able to be sourced and we're at such a critical level that we've got to get these back to the end users. On our end back in the hospital, we know all of the users that wear that small N95 and we're going to need to be able to then go in and pull those masks immediately to be able to then redistribute those. And so this allows us without any kind of electronic cataloging uh, this allows us to manually pull those masks in real time uh, in a way that um, wouldn't have been possible if we just stored them by, by unit or, uh, or mask type. Either one of those by themselves would have required a lot of manual labor to sift through a whole bunch of masks until we found the ones we needed. Next slide. And so then if we do get to a point where we have to redistribute these, um, the mask would be put onto our clean linen trucks, which would stop at our off-site location. They'd be loaded on there, and then on the next slide, they'd be brought back to our hospital, and they would be redistributed again, clean, by our EVS staff um, into designated locations that each of the sites, each of the units that are live with using the N95s have identified. Um, and so what we're doing right now is, even though we're not redistributing the masks, we are redistributing the totes. And so the totes are going through this process as well and arriving back to the hospital on the clean linen trucks. But the masks themselves are being stored at that offsite location. And if everything hopefully continues as it has to date, we may never have to give those back to staff, which would be a, a lot of work for nothing, but um, it, it has been a really cool process to be a part of. Um, and to see us be able to, to innovate something so quickly. Um, but if we do need to use these masks again, uh, we feel like we have a really good process that has uh, decontaminated them as best they could. Um, the final piece to this puzzle is, uh, I mentioned that we had a voltage test uh, to determine how long our cycle time needed to be. The other two things that we did was we had uh, researchers at Bowdoin University, which is another university local to us here in Maine, um, they tested the efficacy of the respirator within the mask at a very, very high intensity of UVC light, which is even above and beyond what we're going to be doing. Uh, and they were able to successfully uh, achieve a full usage of that respirator after going through multiple cycles, which was phenomenal. And so the final piece of the puzzle that we're waiting on is a virology uh, test. So we, uh, two days ago, we put a whole bunch of N95s through the cycle with actual COVID-19 uh, on the masks themselves. And so we have 
another university nearby, the University of New England, that's studying right now whether or not those successfully, uh, those cycles successfully eliminated um, the, the COVID-19 from those masks. All of the hospitals that have done this to date have done their own internal studies that have shown that they in fact did get rid of the virus. Like I mentioned, we're sort of going above and beyond uh, all of them in terms of uh, not only in the intensity of the UVC light, but the amount of cycle time. So we feel very confident that that's going to come back positive, but um, we're awaiting that response on Sunday with an anticipated go live date of Monday. And that is, uh, in a nutshell, what we accomplished here at Maine Health, and I'm happy to answer any questions that might be on the line. Yep, so if anyone does have any questions, you can um, enter them in the chat, which is the thing that looks like a little um, chat bubble towards the bottom um, of your of the, when you hover over the screen, or uh, you can just raise your hand. There's also a raise your hand feature and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Stephen, that was great. I I have a question that I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, if we don't ever have to use these masks, how long are you guys? Have you thought about how long we're going to keep them? If there's a second wave, are we thinking about using them then, or what's like longevity of the mask? Do you think? Yeah, um, it's a great question. We are going to keep these uh, indefinitely. Um, there's no there's no sense of urgency regarding the space. Um, the space that we built to hold these masks was not previously used for for anything that would require us to have to make a difficult decision on on uh, how long we would store these, so to speak, before putting that space back to its previous use. Um, it was just an, an empty part of an offsite, uh, a major offsite warehouse location that we had. So uh, my, my anticipation is that we're going to keep these uh, for, a, for a number of many months. Um, there's no plan to, to get rid of these anytime soon. Awesome. Thanks. Great work. Thank you. You know, the one thing I'll, I'll also share, um, it, it unfortunately wasn't part of the presentation, but it was kind of a neat thing to, to be a part of. Um, I, I mentioned that we had tried to, uh, at first, you, utilize a barcode technology um, to make this thing not only electronic, but um, much less labor intensive than this manual process of having to, to tag all the masks and all of this. And so, when we were going through that, one of the really neat things is uh, the, the innovation team had a lot of really uh, different people in real time pulled into this. And so if you can imagine, uh, many of the folks that were on the, the, on the web page there that you can see on your screen, we were all down in the pharmacy working with their software engineers um, and a whole bunch of pharmacists in real time standing up little walkthroughs and, and trying to walk through this process and, and everybody huddled around the software engineer as he tried to figure out if there was a way to make the, the, um, the narcotic tracking software count for our purposes because it, it didn't count previously. And so it was, it was just really neat to see uh, something like that it happening in real time uh, in, in a health system that uh, you know, given uh, a situation where we're not in a pandemic, you know, might take many months and committee meetings and lots of discussions and approvals and seeing folks just trying things like that in real time. It was, I think somebody made the comment. It was very, it was almost like we were in Silicon Valley or something, but yet we were in Portland, Maine, trying to put this together. So it was just a really, it was a really neat thing to be a part of and to see that you know, if we have the ability to do this in a pandemic, my hope is that we we are keeping these these thoughts and, and themes forward once we get through all of this and apply the same type of rigor and, and outside the box thinking that we did during this time, uh, during times of 
of normalcy. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Stephen. This is really great work. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. Fullerton so that um, he has enough time. But we've included all of the email addresses. So if you have any more questions for Stephen, please reach out to him. Oh, and there's and also Dr. a couple, um, just to say, there's a couple of uh, links that we're going to be sending out that Stephen shared that their team used as well. So, sorry, Alex. Um, Dr. Fullerton, would you like to share your screen or would you like me to continue on here? Continue on there, Ali. And uh, also, so I have to make a disclaimer, everyone. Um, so we had to de-identify uh, who we work for and all the really kind of nuts and bolts of our plan, um, just because we work for the government. So I had to make that disclaimer. I'm not representing uh, the government in this in this uh, presentation, but I do think it's important to kind of share, um, um, you know, a meeting of the minds, you know, best practices. And so this is how we we kind of define what the new normal is going to be. Um, anybody that tells you they're an expert in standing up after a pandemic is probably over 100 years old. I think the last one happened in the 1920s, roughly, um, or the potato famine, one of those big ones. Uh, but anybody that tells you they're an expert at this is lying because it's just not true. Um, but hopefully we can kind of go through this and, and show you that we kind of did a lot of, you know, task force, a lot of thinking through processes um, and something that you think makes sense. Well, so uh, yeah, if you could run the, the presentation for me, that would be excellent. Yep, definitely can. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so we're calling this, you know, defining the new normal. And so some of the people that, who um, are going to be speaking on, on this slide deck is Dr. Rosetta Daniels, uh, who's one of our, our key nurse uh, leaders and uh, executives in our organization. And also uh, Ms. Sharon Henderson, uh, who has done a lot of great work um, in DOD uh, on, on a global scale. So we asked her, uh, she's part of my team, and so we asked her to speak on this as well. And, and so credit where credit is due, uh, this presentation was put together by Sharon, and we call it Sharonized because that's a, a level of excellence now that we, we, we our new normal is. And uh, so this presentation is Sharonized. So, um, and probably we put it together at the point of 30 minutes this morning as we were just defining and writing our draft of this for our system. So, okay, with that, uh, moving forward, and by the way, Stephen, I think you guys are doing a really good job up there. Uh, we're doing similar things uh, working with Duke, and I think you guys are actually ahead of the curve. So, good job. Thank you. So, I just kind of, you know, you know, I do things very data-driven, uh, and I think, you know, with this, you know, the easy thing to do was to stand up a response, and I've been at this job for about two months, and my second day, I was asked to stand up uh, a whole healthcare system with the COVID response. So literally, it's kind of racking my brain, and how do I do this? And so at that point, we really said, all right, let's let's make sure this is patient-centric, and our response is due to um, you know, persons under investigation and COVID-positive patients. So we really didn't have that many variables to kind of deal with. Um, so this, this slide is actually kind of important. This gets put out by... Carolina. It kind of shows you a lot of uh, information in a very, you know, compressed way. So you can kind of see that we're still on the rise um, of COVID positives. You know, our total death rate is declining, um, and, and some things have declined, and, and we're tracking those seroprevalence cases, and that's going to become important, become important when I talk about some things in the future. So this is kind of a, a snapshot, if you will, dashboard of, of where we stand as of the 28th of April. That's the most current things we have. Now, we're tracking it internally, and so we know day by day uh, what we're doing down to the variables, the multivariables that, that we're doing our regression analysis on. So uh, so everyone kind of take a gander at that. That's kind of a really good graphic to kind of say, hey, here's what, here's, here's the state of North Carolina, and here's what we're doing. So we have, you know, in our system, now I can't define what our system is. You guys can look on our LinkedIn. But our system is pretty large, and so we have a lot of people in our catchment area. So next slide. So this is the, the dashboard by the state of North Carolina. I didn't think this was robust enough, so we started doing our own surveillance on the 14th. And, and we started looking at not just by cases, but we, you know, and this is a trend analysis, right? So I wanted to see, I wanted to do a regression analysis on 
positive somewhere um, in, in the state versus our, our catchment area. And then drill it down to also um, how many COVID deaths in the state of North Carolina versus our catchment area. And then also uh, how many persons under investigation that we know, you know, once you test somebody, they may test negative, right? But, but because there's some false positive rates, but we wanted to make sure that we were capturing that data because um, there is a lag time, right? Because uh, the virus shedding 37 days of viral shedding, you know, we have had, you know, some false positives in North Carolina that we need to account for that may turn seropositive. So uh, next slide, please. You kind of see that, that, you know, as a state, you know, we're kind of getting over the curve, right? They, they reported out that, you know, at 16th and 18th, that's where our peak was. But as we know, you know, we have to always be cognizant of, of all right, where do we, where, what are we looking at now? And can we turn, are we turning the, you know, the pendulum sw swinging the other way? And in Cumberland County, uh, one of our major counties, um, along the wake, we've had an uptick. So when you're when you're looking at the bio uh, prevalence and, and serial prevalence of the disease state, you really gotta you know be able to put your foot on the brakes and say, all right, hold on a sec, let's 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 rethink this opening to a new phase. Let's actually think about are we surging back up again? So we need to come up with a COVID response plan again. We developed that into like a three phase system as well. So, uh, next slide, please. So, you can kind of see based on um, two days ago, our hospitalizations have increased in the state of North Carolina. All that's important um, because as we drill down to what that's doing in our system, you know, we have to track the biosurveillance of, of the whole state of North Carolina and compare that to where our hot pockets are of, of COVID outbreak. So next slide, please. So this is kind of what we thought about as a first pass. And we've been kind of thinking about this for two weeks and setting up a large system, it's it's hard, right? Because, you know, the new normal um, and, and what we forgot to put on here is actually the uh, colors of it. So you kind of read what the color is going to be. The reason is because I went to Harvard and that's the only reason why it says crimson. They didn't want red. And so I was like, all right, let's make it crimson. Um, so I apologize about that in advance. It's not a Harvard plug. Uh, it's a very expensive school, a very good school, but very expensive. Um, but we put Crimson in the first phase because it kind of dovetails into our COVID response that went into a crisis phase, which was X amount of patients overloading our hospital system, where we're now we're, we're in like a mass casualty type situation. So the phased approach to a new normal plan that we thought about is literally taking taking you know, all our service lines and standing them up 20%. And in that 20%, we look at the risk stratification of that 20%. So patients that really need to be seen face-to-face uh, -face and, and who can be seen in a telemedicine capacity. And, you know, I'm going to go into that a little more later on in the talk, but I really believe that, that we're looking at um, a new normal of what how we're going to approach healthcare. I, I really believe that because before, uh, our system had this pandemic, you know, we weren't using telemedicine that much. But now, all our patients are being saved by telemedicine. So, so with that, with that, you know, what does our new normal look like? And so this is kind of what we came, came up with that kind of made sense. You know, our most risky things are our surgeries, um, elective procedures from surger, surgical specialties, and also the, the medicine-based uh, procedurals as well, um, and also the intake. So, when we're looking at that, procedures are going to be our most risky. So we have a plan following uh, national guidelines, you know, the American College of Surgeons, also national guidelines for our organization, you know, say that when, when should we start doing uh, procedures again? And if we're not going to do procedures, what's our resource to, to start them up and when? So you can kind of see through phase one through phase five um, what our plan is to start first um, in a very large system. And, and this presents, you know, not only, you know, a conversion from telemedicine back to face-to-face, -face, but it also represents a challenge logistically and operationally. How do you operationalize a, a whole large system when, when now appointments are booked out you know, via telemedicine into July? How do we stand that back up and, and start seeing patients face-to-face? -face? 
So that's kind of a uh, you know a, a broad stroke, if you will, uh, of a paintbrush of what we what we thought would be best and most conservative. Now on the on the phase approach, next slide, please. The phase to phase criteria really depends on this, and and I wanted to make this important because. This is this is important because um, as we move from phase to phase, there had to be some type of criteria, not just the, the surge of COVID patients, but uh, really you know the seroprevalence data uh, of five different variables. So that's what we kind of came up with. Um, and you, 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 I don't want to read off the slide. You guys can kind of read because I already touched on this before. So uh, next slide, please. I know you guys, you know. So I know you guys probably. Um, Kind of, you know, are kind of salivating at regression analysis and trend analysis. Actually, a doctor should have hit because we don't know this stuff in medical school. We don't get taught it. You know, I learned stuff in Boston, and and I learned how to do jump software uh, with the SAS you know, then. So I thought that that you know, with a multivariable approach, uh, phase approach, a regression analysis would be our when we put on the brakes, right, or when we move forward. So we want to be able to see those downward trends. With statistical statistical significance, uh, when we move from phase to phase. Now, it was brought up yesterday in in a work group that that we may be in phase five for a very very long time. Not due to being able to see patients, but really the logistical challenge of standing back up the system. And I'll, and I'll say that again: the logistical challenge of standing up an entire system that's all in telemedicine right now, moving back to a face to face visit, and what does that look like? So next slide, please. So the work groups we put together is, is pretty robust. I believe in, in putting together teams of task force so we can, we can effectively you know, tackle challenges and problems and come together in, in a collaborative way where we, we're moving forward as a unit and also moving forward with the most careful, calculated, data-driven decisions we can. And so kind of this is what we kind of put together um, and this is, you know, things that are in, in normal healthcare systems. Um, but, you know, kind of going throughout down to the list, you know, we kind of always forget about the, the last two, right, is is mental health resiliency. You know, as we had, you know, recently, you know, some of the providers in, in New York, um, the suicide because of being on the front lines and the mental health um, challenges they face of receiving COVID positive patients and, and also, you know, um, you know, having death related to COVID patients all around them, you know, that part was kind of, I think, done a little bit in, you know, on the COVID standup. So we wanted to really address it on this part of it because it's going to be here to stay for a long time. And we need to, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So we need to be able to deal with those mental health issues of our, of our healthcare teams um, effectively as well as, as the patients. And the last thing is, is communication. Communication, I think, is, is probably the most important part of you know, the system to stand up their healthcare operations, is how do we communicate that effectively and where everybody understands. And if you know, everyone can remember um, you know, back in the Napoleon uh, days, Napoleon would give uh, a brief to his, his, his aide and say, hey, can you understand this message? And if, if that person can understand it, then he would kind of have lost the battlefield. So if, if we're not doing that and it can't be communicated to, to the most um, subordinate level, um, not inferior, but subordinate level, then we're not, not doing an effective communication plan standing up a healthcare system. So next slide, please. So, you know, the, we developed the clinical integration team um, that really looks at the national guidelines, the CC guidelines. And then, and then also try to, to uh, design a specific plan to, to kind of risk stratify patients in a system, like who seen first. So we kind of looked at those in two different uh, categories, urgent or routine, right? Who, who needs to be seen now? Who can wait? You know, and, and based on each service line, that's going to be very specific. You know, in our, you know, we have you know, almost 20 different areas. Um, sites and uh, uh, so it's a very large healthcare system uh, literally the whole you know southeast of Florida area so it, we had to take that into account as well because you know each, each site will have a specific challenge 
we want to make sure we're, we're meeting those challenges, not putting out a, a, you know, a generalized plan that's not going to work for them. So that was kind of important, you know, kind of really think through that process and, and the plan that may be modified based on the site appearance. I'm going to let um, my colleague Sharon Henderson um, on this part. So be with me one sec, Sharon. So she's going to go through the rest, and I'll kind of come back and, and close it out. The uh, only reason why is, is I have to be on a, a call. Uh, that yeah, there are some yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll I'll we'll describe why. Sharon. Good afternoon, I'm Sharon Henderson. Sorry for the quick swap out. Um, host protection is one of the most important aspects that you have to consider when moving from open to normal operations, as well as, of course, during normal COVID uh, response. You have to make sure before you return to patient care that you have enough PPE to cover all of your <clears throat> employees as well as enough to ensure that any patients that come into your facility that don't have a mask, um, that we have masks available for them to wear as well. You have to make sure that the, that the burn rates match the availability and that the appropriate people have on the appropriate PPE. Another important aspect is to make sure that just like during the COVID response, you have to analyze the geography of every building to make sure that you have established routes and designated places where the COVID positive patients are going to be located. We don't commingle co positive patients with It's very important, of course, to make sure that you have enough testing resources available to test both your staff and uh, your patients. So, for example, for us with our nursing home patients, our CLC nursing patients, our we test all of our staff that go on to be CLC ward with the high risk population. We have to always make sure that we have enough tests available for our staff as well as for the patients before we open operations to bring more uh, outpatients back into our facility. We're in the process of redetermining our screening criteria for the campus entry. Uh, daily, we keep up to date with the CDC recommendations. Today, we implemented universal masking as well as checking the temperature of everyone who comes onto our campus, which of course created multiple logistical challenges, which I'm sure you can all relate to. And another thing to consider in terms of protecting your employees is maximizing telework and alternate work schedules. I'm sure you all have been surprised at the degree of efficiency that we can all obtain with telework schedules using video teleconference, teleconference. And, you know, for, for us here, especially um, in our organization, it has really been eye-opening as to how efficient we can remain by maximizing um, telework and also the, the quality of work that can be can be done night weekends for those who had child care issues. And as we continue through the summer and perhaps even into the next school year, because we don't know what the school year is going to look like, are they going to stagger schedules for the kids or, you know, we just don't know. I think it's going to be important from an HR perspective to take care of our employees to make sure that we provide alternate work schedules for our, our employees. Next slide, please. From an occupational health perspective, that have those very specific employee screening and monitoring processes. As you, I'm sure you all know, that part of the challenge is communicating to the employees what their responsibilities are to keep everyone safe. If you don't feel well, come, don't come to work. We have to continue to emphasize that. You know, don't, don't come in, call, and we'll provide you with instructions for what, for what you need to do. And as well as occupational health calling and tracking those employees checking up on how they're doing, and providing very specific return to work protocols to maintain their health and the health of everyone. So human resources, policies, and procedures to meet the unique circumstances. You know, are you, are you going to have special leave policies or provisions for people who contract COVID-19? Is it going to 
going to be dependent on whether they contracted COVID-19 here at work or whether they got it somewhere else. Obviously, in many cases, it's pretty easy to understand where it was that they contracted it. So is it going to be a universal policy that's going to be applied across the board, or is it going to be situation dependent? It's very, very important to determine exactly what those criteria are now so that they can you have a process in place ahead of time so that it can be used at any time um, all of the as we um, transition into this next phase. And then of course tracking the health status of employees who display the, the symptoms or who are diagnosed diagnosed with the COVID-19. Next please. Environmental services also have realized could be the Achilles heel of everything within our organizations. And I think that that is going to be also equally important as we move forward. Facility cleanliness and disinfection will be even more critical than before. Doorknobs, um, you know, baseboards, waiting room areas, anywhere that anyone may touch as we begin to increase the volume of people who return to the facility. I don't know about you guys, but our housekeeping employees are not the highest paid personnel within the facility. So what are some unique ways that we can go about keeping those employees engaged and showing them our appreciation for everything that they're doing to keep our patients and our other employees safe? Creating the physical barriers within the facility to ensure that you maintain the six foot social distancing is going to be very important. Go and methodically look at every waiting room and every place where you're going to be bringing people back into the facility. And are you going to use physical barriers? Are you going to use plexiglass barriers to protect some of the staff and some employees? One of the things that we did is we discontinued the usage of our um, check-in machines. That, you know, the patients normally would be able to come in and check in on a little iPad type thing. We discontinued use of that. When are we going to resume operations with that? What is what are the you know cleaning routines going to be for that? Are we going to place X's on the floor? What are the routes going to be throughout the facility? Are um, routes throughout the facility going to become more restricted? Things of that things of that nature. And one of the other critical factors to consider is maintaining low patient volumes where possible by maximizing the use of telehealth and telehealth. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Fullerton. Thanks. <laughs> so, so thanks to you guys for being patient with us. So uh, as you know, in, in healthcare, things change uh, pretty rapidly. And so uh, we have um, two times a day where we have to be on like uh, this executive team um, from our systems and that kind of co coincided with this with this talk so I apologize I have to step off for a second so you know this was something that was brought up in, in one of the task forces is, is really you know again going back to what's our new normal you know how many patients do want to come in and how many people want to stay on telemedicine you know, there's a convenience factor and I think you know you know and I can speak to this and I'm not being derogatory you know most millennials that I've talked to and my wife being one of them and said, I would rather do a virtual visit. If I can make it convenient for myself, we have two little girls, and uh, and our little girls are 16 months and almost four. And she's like, if I can do it from home, and, and I can get my, my, my prescriptions I needed for my, for, you know, what, what she needs, you know, so we don't have any more kids, because we're not having more kids. Uh, you know, so she's like, yeah, give me a telemedicine visit, because it, it saves me more time from going in than to, to, to see, you know, you know, schlep all our kids, you know, to, to the doctor's office with her while I'm working and can't help out. And so what's that new normal look like? I don't I'm not, I'm I don't have the answer. But I know some of our some of our older patient population actually really like it. So, you know, are we gonna be at twenty five percent telemedicine? Are we gonna be at fifty percent? I mean, who knows? That time will tell. But what we do know is is in a little over a month's time we stood up an entire telemedicine system, a wide approach to not only helping those with the COVID response um, using telemedicine, but also 
to see all of our patients in the system via telemedicine. It's pretty incredible, right? For being able to use a fee to do that. Now going back to the other piece, you know, how do we how do we how do we step back out of the system? And how many people are gonna want to come back? So I think, you know, being, being, you know, I'm a techie guy, you know, I think, you know, and I had, uh, you know, in the telemedicine company, we provided executive leadership. Um, so you take a, a, a one, you know, and typically how medicine goes is you take the most productive person, right, Pro productive provider, sometimes the most popular provider, and you make them a leader. Then you make them a 0.75 FTE. 4.5 FTEs, so then I'm thinking, just, just decrease somebody's productivity. To me, I, my mind doesn't work that way. I say take the least productive and make them a leader. <laughs> so you have your, your, your people who are just churning out RVUs, you know, leave, let them stay with doing what they're doing best, which is doing medicine or surgery. So I think this, this telehealth um, piece is going to be a really important piece going forward in the future. Um, and I think the COVID-19 pandemic was, was the catalyst for that change. Our teams were, were forced to go to telemedicine. As, as you guys know, if you ever work with doctors, that's a hard thing to do. Force a doctor to do anything. So uh, it's a challenge. Uh, it can be done. But I think uh, as, as under the auspices of, of the pandemic, you know, they may actually like it a little bit better as well. So we may get the provider buy in buy in as well. Uh, as well. Our next slide, please. Thanks. And just a quick time check. We have about three minutes left. So you guys can kind of we'll, we'll send you the the slides. Um, this is kind of you know what we kind of put together as we're going through our responses and how we keep people safe. Uh, next slide. I think you're on mute. I am on mute. I had I had three or four slides with all mute. So I apologize, you guys. You guys can kind of look at the slides and kind of tell what we've kind of done from a face response. And then if there's any questions on the slides that I when I was mute, I apologize. Um, next slide, please. So the last part of this is communication. You know, communicate your plan. Um, you establish your goals. You know, Determine how you're going to do things. You execute, and then you evaluate, and then modify if necessary. This is going to be really important post-COVID, um, especially looking at what, what's going to come in the winter season. This will this will change, and I think it'll change uh, drastically. We'll have a vaccine by that time, and um, what we learn now we can apply to, to later and lessons learned from things like this and, and think tanks like this. I think I think. We're going to learn a lot how to deal with a pandemic because I've dealt with epidemics in the past with a couple other former jobs, but I never dealt with a pandemic before. With that, I think that's the end of the slide presentation. And, uh, thank you for being uh, patient with us as I had to drop off to go to a you know, system wide um, command structure meeting real quick. My piece, and I, that's why I came back. So I apologize not being mute. No worries. Thank you guys so much. I think this was really a great presentation and a, something that's very hot topic right now as we're looking at what's going to happen post COVID. So thank you again. We put out the email for if anybody wants to email me, uh, please email me at my civilian email, which is drfullerton at gmail.com. Um, so just drfullerton at gmail. And that's the one to use instead of, the, instead of uh, my government email. So, so thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. And we'll send out um, his Gmail email, and we also have his other email attached to the slide deck. So we'll send out all these slides, and if you have any questions, please reach out to the speakers or one of us. Thank you guys again for this think tank. I really enjoy it, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.